Go back. No, go back. <laughs> Can you please stay? You have a feather on your nose, babe. <laughs> it's, it's flapping in the wind. Okay, Pudge, this is how it's gonna work. I'm going to put one treat in my hand. If you can find it, then I will talk about propagation today. But if you don't find it, then I'm gonna go back to bed. Deal? Okay. Can you guess which one it is? This one? <gasps> Good job! All right, I guess I gotta work today. So I have my little guy here with me, he's very tired. <laughs> I feel like he's just been like perpetually tired. Actually, we've been perpetually tired. Um, it's been a long, it's been a long month. But anyway, today I wanted to talk about propagation. And I feel like this one is kind of a heavy one. There's like so much ground to cover just in terms of all of the different methods and the process behind each method. And I can't really wrap my mind around how to sort of go through this in a way that is like methodical or makes sense. So just a forewarning, it's probably gonna jump around all over the place. It might be a little bit garbled, but yeah, it's just gonna be me shooting the shit about, um, I guess the propagation methods that work for me and my process and just kind of stuff that I've learned along the way. And hopefully you just find it helpful if you're having problems propagating or like, there's like a certain method that you can't seem to get the hang of. So yeah, I'll go over water propagation, perlite propagation, LECA and Latrusa pond propagation. I will go over how I sort of mix the substrate sometimes for more finicky plants. And then I'll just give you a quick peek into like the plant room where I have my propagation exoterra. And yeah, and then I'll answer some questions along the way and also at the very end. Let's just let's just see how this all comes together. I don't know. It's 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 a mess in my brain right now, but hopefully I can um piece it together. So Pudge, I think we should start this video now. I think he's ready for a nap. <laughs> what do you think we should start with first? Water? Oh yeah, okay, we can do that. Do you want to go get the water? Okay, go get it. Oh. <laughs> go get the water. Two cups, please. I'm getting my work area set up here. Um, before I start, let's get this out of the way. All of these scars on my wrists, <laughs> they are not from me being clumsy. Um, next door to us is another pug. Her name is Puggy Sue, and she's still a puppy. And uh, she loves me. So whenever I see her like outside or in the hallways, she's just like, she's all over the place. And uh, yeah, she got me, she got me good last time. <laughs> so everything's all good. Um, I wanted to show you my new potting mat though. This is what I'm gonna be working on today since I am going to be working with um, water. So basically it's just a like clear plastic Mat like this. I got this from the Bungle Jungle. Um, her name is Alicia and she's from Vancouver. Um, I bought this one, by the way. So what you do is just, you just, oh, thank you, Pudge. Um, you snap the corners like this. And then, Got a nice little work area, and then this little flappy thing. You just roll it back. Ta-da! Okay, so this is what I have today. I'm going to be showing you guys my favorite uh, propagation substrates. So in addition to water, I'm also going to be showing you how I propagate in moss, 
how I propagate in perlite, in the choose upon, in LECA, and then also how I sort of mix the substrate sometimes um, for more finicky plants. And uh, I'm kind of excited to show that part because it's just been, it's been a lot of experimenting and I finally found something that works. And yeah, I'd love to share it with you guys. So gosh, can you tell in my voice that I'm feeling like super overwhelmed? Um, yeah, okay, let's get started. The first thing I wanna cover is water propagation. And this one is like the most basic way to propagate things. Off the bat, there are a lot of people in the hobby that strongly advise against water propagating. And while I respect everyone's opinions, water propagating has been great for me. I will say that I never water propagate long term if the goal is gonna be moving that plant to soil. I only water propagate if the goal is gonna be moving it to LECA or PON. Um, so just keep that in mind. And I have two orchid cuttings. These have been rooting for a very long time, as you can see. This is probably about seven months of root production. This is about maybe three months. And you can see the color difference. This water hasn't been changed for like three weeks. This one hasn't been changed for one week. And while it's not completely cloudy, um, it's also not completely clear either. Okay, I'm going to take these out of the water that it's in. This isn't terrible, but it's also not great. You want to try and keep your water as clear as possible and as clean as possible. And one way that you can sort of minimize the amount of times that you need to change water is to keep these clear jars out of direct sunlight because that is gonna be your number one catalyst for algae buildup. So either keeping it in sort of a more indirect light situation, keeping it away from windowsills, um, or even just like putting these pots in inside of cover pots that are not see-through, that'll also help slow down algae buildup. Um, but to be honest, it's sort of inevitable with, with water propagation. A little bit of algae is not gonna kill your plants. Like obviously this plant's doing just fine. You can see how delicate water roots are. There's like a bunch of those like secondary fine roots floating around. And then this is one week of no water change and it's just a little bit cloudy. Um, just like on a normal routine like walkthrough, I would see this and probably ignore it <laughs> and give it about another week. My recommendation is if you're super, super on top of your propagation maintenance, weekly water changes are great or bi-weekly. And it really just depends on the conditions and I'll go through that a little bit later. I wanna show you this, this orchid cactus. And like I mentioned, this is about six months of root production and it's super healthy and happy. Um, at this point, with the roots being this long, it was ready to move to a permanent, a permanent substrate a while ago. But since this plant specifically is just sort of a filler plant on my shelf, the goal is to not really try and get it to grow big and, and lush. I kind of just want it to live. <laughs> and in that case, I'm probably just gonna keep it in water because it's doing so great. If my goal was to grow this as big as my mother plant, at this point, I would probably move it to Lechuzapon, which is naturally more nutrient rich um, and is a better long-term substrate than water. Keep in mind that when you're growing plants in water, you will very rarely get a nice full plant growing at its full potential. Um, water can be a long-term sort of substrate for a plant, but you'll notice that the leaves aren't going to be as big, the leaves aren't going to hold on um, for as long as it could if it were maybe in soil or LECA or pond, even with sort of regular fertilizing. So yeah, it can be done. You can grow plants in water long-term. I've had apothos in water for probably 
close to four years and it did just fine. It's still living, still kicking. So yeah, if anyone tells you that you can't keep a plant in water long-term, I would say one, it depends on which plant. Vining plants do amazing in water long-term, but I wouldn't keep something like a monstera in water long-term, unless it was like an aquarium or something. If you're talking about, you know, when is it ready to move to a substrate from water, I would say when the roots are about like this long, so maybe like six or seven inches. Um, if you're noticing that the plant is not holding on to leaves for as long as you think it could, it's probably ready to move. Again, it just depends what your goal for the plant is. This is the second cutting and at this point, I would say that these are not ready to move to a permanent substrate. The roots are probably about four, four to five inches long and I would want it to be just a little bit longer so that it has a better chance of like clinging on to whatever substrate I'm gonna move it to which will most likely be a mix of Lekka and Lechusapan because I've been doing that a lot recently and I'll go into that also at the end of this video. So yeah, water propagation is great. Just some notes to keep in mind. Water roots are different than soil roots. I don't know the exact science behind it, but the way water roots are formed in water, it's to be able to breathe in water. So when you move those kinds of roots into soil, they can't breathe the same way and they suffocate. And that's why you'll notice a lot of the times when you move plants that have all water roots straight into soil, um, they rot. And it goes the other way around too. Like if I were to just uproot one of my established soil plants and just like dunk it into water, the chances of those roots rotting is very high. So just keep in mind that water roots and soil roots are different. And um, yeah, water roots are great if you're planning to grow in passive hydro, but if you want to, if you want to move that plant to soil eventually, I would not recommend um, water for long-term propagation. I am going to go through the environmental conditions that I give my water propagations while I clean up. So for all of my water props, I actually just try and keep them um, away from windows because I don't want it to get too warm just because like, as you can see, I'm not the greatest with changing out water. And you guys, if you have never smelled sort of like, what's the word? <laughs> Super ripe, rotten, mucky, disgusting propagation water before, consider yourself lucky because I feed Pudge a raw um, diet. He's on duck and tripe now and I consider it to be one of the worst smells I've ever smelled. It smells like just, just like flesh and and just trash um, but I will take that smell over propagate like gross propagation water anytime so honestly do yourself a favor and um, just know your conditions so that you're you don't have to smell it because um, it's, it's awful so basically I like to put it in a place that's still getting enough light um, it doesn't need to be super, super warm. Obviously, warmth is a great um, catalyst for root production, but I don't use any heat mats or anything like that just because I'm scared of it catching fire. I've just read horror stories and I have friends in the reptile industry who have also told me horror stories and have just said if I can avoid using a heat mat, I should. And like, I can barely, you know, cook a meal without starting a fire. So that's just one thing that I don't need to add on to my list of anxieties. Um, so I also pick up these whenever I can. And these are just amber glass bottles. Don't buy them brand new. You can usually find them at thrift stores or antique stores for super cheap. And these are great for propagation because it sort of blocks out some of that light um, coming in and it really slows down the algae production process. So um, yeah, these are amazing. So while we're on the topic of water propagation and like algae buildup and just like gross things happening in the water specifically, 
I want to show you guys this cool little thing that I've been using for like a year now. And um, I, I didn't start this. I forgot where I saw it the first time, but this is just an aquarium bubbler. So this is an air pump and just plastic tubing with an air stone. And you can get all of this at like your local pet store. It's all fairly cheap. Um, I think all of this maybe cost me like under $25 maybe. What an air stone does is it, what does it do? <laughs> an air stone helps with water circulation and it infuses oxygen in the water by creating little tiny bubbles that rise to the surface of the water and it just like pulls it back down and then all of that water is just like rich in oxygen. So you use this in aquariums to just kind of keep the water moving because stagnant water is like your biggest enemy and that's how you get a lot of gross things that build up in the water. So this is great for propagations that maybe are a bit more finicky or are more susceptible to rot. Um, I've had great success with it. Unfortunately, this was my last resort when I tried to root my Big Thai constellation that is now in the afterlife. But otherwise, it's been amazing. So I'll just show you how I use it. I got my orchid cactus container cleaned out and I'm just going to drop this air stone in there and carefully get this back in. These roots are so delicate. In general, water roots are much more delicate than um, than soil roots and that's why they grow significantly faster in water because they're just, yeah, they're really thin and, and delicate and hairline and you get it, they're fragile. Whoa. Oh, that was anticlimactic. Okay, you don't wanna work. There we go. Beautiful. The roots love this, they love the movement um, they love the increased oxygen in there. It keeps things a lot fresher for a lot longer. And I don't do this for all of my water propagations, just the ones that like are giving me a hard time or that I'm like really scared of rotting. I'm gonna unplug it now because it's kind of loud, but let me just give you one more closer look at how it works. I have tested probably five different types of air pumps and surprisingly this one that I just picked up from Walmart is my favorite one so far. I like it because it has these rubber feet that prevent it from slipping around and it's generally more quiet than the other ones that I've used before. This one is just Tetra brand and I honestly think it was like $19. So if you want my recommendation, this is the one that I would go with. Okay, so now I'm going to show you guys how I take propagations and prep them for water propagation specifically. Um, to be honest, when I'm taking cuttings, I rarely ever do anything besides water propagating. I usually always start it in water, regardless if I'm gonna be moving it to soil or whatever. I always start it in water just to get the roots going, um, just cause I find that's the best method for me. I can't even remember the last time that I like took a cutting and just stuck it in moss or stuck it in um, like LECA or something. So I'm going to be chopping down this Milano Chrysum today just cause it's getting kind of tall. What I'm going to do is cut this tallest one here. There's actually two plants in here. So between each of the nodes is the internode, which is this space right here. Node, node, internode. Underneath, and it, it just depends on each plant, but with the Melanochrysum specifically, the auxiliary point, which is the secondary growth point that's gonna come from a non-top cutting, is hidden underneath this 
petiolar sheath here. Sometimes it's like back here, sometimes it's like on the side and you can see it, but typically it's inside of that sheath so you can't really see it. And this this angle on this focusing is just zero out of 10 today. Anyway, um, so when I'm taking cuttings like this, I typically cut as close to the leaf as possible. So I'm going to cut, what am I gonna cut? I'm actually going to cut these three leaves so what I'll do, no, 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 backtrack. I'm gonna cut these two leaves. So what I wanna do is cut right here because I wanna give myself enough space um, to account for rot if that happens. Cause if I just cut like right here close to the node, if it rots, you lose this node and, and then it's this leaf is just done and then you have to try and salvage the remaining node. So what you want to do is just cut as close to that auxiliary node as possible, making sure to not chop into it, of course. And then that way I've got at least a couple inches to work with. I'm just going to cut right here, sort of at an angle. And it fell off the table. So this is my cutie little cutting that I took. And you can see um, I'm working with a couple inches of stem. So yeah, feeling good about it. This is my cutting and I'm gonna try not to move it because my camera won't focus. Usually with any kind of philodendron, it's going to secrete this sort of like liquidy substance and you wanna be careful because this can be irritating to the skin. Um, I've actually had like a full on rash from propagating a monstera and forgetting to wash my hands or use gloves. And I got just like hives all down my arms. Um, so yeah, I can already see that it's bleeding a little bit of that liquid. So I'm just going to wash my hands and then I'm going to get this dipped in rooting hormone. This is the rooting hormone that I use and it's just Garden Safe brand. I think I just picked this up from Lowe's and a little bit goes a long way. I've had this same container for what seems like forever. And I have noticed um, a difference between my propagations that are dipped in rooting hormone versus not. And the main thing I've observed is that it just roots a lot faster. I can't say that it like makes your plants grow like way crazier roots or anything, but I have noticed in terms of just the speed of rooting, the rooting hormone has helped a lot. So I just have a bit in here. And what I'm gonna do is take the stem that is still, and of course it's not focusing, um, that's still a little bit wet from that natural sort of like sap it secretes, and I'm just gonna dip it. Sorry, there's children outside screaming their heads off. Okay. And that's basically it. And what I'll do is I'll just let this sit for maybe an hour or two. This is gonna turn sort of into like a solid on the, on the stem and then I'll just stick it in water. And you'll notice that a little bit of the rooting hormone will make your water a bit cloudy, but it's totally fine. Um, if you don't mind it, then go ahead and do that. I've also read that people wash it off, but I like to keep it on there. And, um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna let this dry up a bit and then I will get it into water. The next thing I wanna talk about is fertilizing your water props. And I do think that fertilizing is an important part of keeping them happy in water for longer periods. Um, sometimes, you know, cuttings can take a long time to root as much as you'd want it to before it's ready to move to its um, permanent home, I guess. So making sure that you're fertilizing will allow the plant to continue its growth without being stunted. I mean, sometimes it does because it's been chopped, obviously, but you'll just find that your cuttings will do much better if you are still providing it with some nutrients. Also, please bear with me. Um, yesterday, I spent all day filming and it was just the worst day ever. So I had to scrap all that footage. I started over today and my voice is like starting to go. So, <clears throat> if I sound hoarse, that's why. <laughs> 
What I'm going to be using is Marfil Soil Enhancer and although it's branded as a soil enhancer, you can use this with water and you can also use it with Passive Hydro and with moss. And then I'm also gonna be using CalMag, which is super rich in like magnesium, nitrogen, and iron. There's also um, manganese and zinc. Anyway, oh, and calcium, did I say that? I'm gonna be using a really diluted amount of each of these, and the recommended portioning for Marfil is 20 parts fresh water to one part Marfil, and for CalMag, it's two milliliters, Per one liter of water and this jug is 2.5 liters it's not filled up all the way as you can see but honestly when I'm fertilizing I don't do it to like an exact like an exact amount and I know that a lot of people are super super good about doing that but that's just not me and I choose to just eyeball everything if I can but I will say that I have um, kind of found my groove with with these two and I do two milliliters of CalMag and I do six milliliters of Marfil for this 2.5 liter jug. So yeah, let me show you how I do it. I just have a dropper here and this is a three milliliter dropper. I'm just going to add my Marfil first. You always wanna make sure to shake it so that like all of that gunk at the bottom <laughs> gets mixed in really well because that's where all the good stuff is. And if you've never used Marfil before, this stuff is amazing, but it really stinks. Um, okay, so like I said, I'm gonna do six milliliters of Marfil. And then I'm going to do two milliliters of CalMag. I have my Milano that I cut earlier and this is the propagation vial I'm gonna be using for it. And I'm just gonna take a tiny bit of this fertilizer water, and it looks like I've got about two milliliters in there. And I'm just gonna add it. And honestly, that's it. Like I just add a tiny bit into um, the water that I'm using and obviously if I was going to use a much bigger container I would have put more than two milliliters but um, yeah again I don't have it down to like an exact science or like number I just I know that this is really diluted I know that it's not going to burn my roots so you know I'm I just yeah I just go with what feels right <laughs> This guy is gonna just stay in here and I'll probably just plop it in one of my exoterras. And I'm probably gonna see roots on this in, in about a week, I think. So long story short, I do fertilize my water propagations, but I don't actually have an exact um, sort of like ratio for water propagations. I do have a ratio for the jug that I use, but not like for what I use for each container. Um, I just go with what my heart tells me. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. The next substrate that I wanna talk about is LECA and LECA has saved my ass so many times. I find that it's a great substrate to use for more finicky plants and um, propagations that have thicker stems. If you've ever propagated a more mature Monstera deliciosa, you know like how thick those stems can get and how um, sensitive and delicate the, the core of those stems can be. They rot so easily. I have a few Monstera Deliciosa Brazilian common forms that are like notoriously difficult to root. Um, I struggled a lot with it. It was a lot of trial and error. I lost a lot of stem. I lost a lot of propagations. Um, but I feel like I finally cracked the code and LECA was a huge part of that. What I have here is my Mojito Syngonium and this one was given to me rooted in moss but unfortunately um, when I moved it to soil it rotted and I had to start over so I just cut it all back and I rooted it straight in LECA and I actually haven't checked on this since I plopped it in here but it's pushing out a new leaf and it seems happy, 
the leaves haven't yellowed or anything so I feel like some good stuff is happening in here so let's let's just go check so as I mentioned in the beginning of this video Alicia made this potting mat that I ordered but she was also kind enough to make me like a little mini version which I love so much this is gonna come in handy in my plant room and um, for things like this where I typically would probably just use a bowl but now I have this Oh, I forgot that I added Lekka to it, or um, Pawn. I've been doing that a lot recently and I didn't want to talk about that till the end, but since we're here, I guess maybe we can just do a Lekka and Pawn um, highlight. You can see how much it's rooted and this was rootless before. I had to start over and, and yeah, it's looking really good. Basically what I've been doing is mixing Lekka and Pawn. Um, and the reason that I've been doing this is because Pawn dries out so fast. And everybody has been suggesting self-watering pots to me, but I'm going to tell you right now, I am not willing to shell out the money <laughs> for self-watering pots. And I just, I like my clear vases. They're cheap and I can see right through them. And I just, yeah, it's just, it's not for me. So mixing pond with Lekka has allowed me to um, maintain my passive hydro plants easier than it would be if it was purely in pond. Because I love, I love pond. I've noticed some pretty like insane results um, when I compare my plants that have been living in Lekka and then just in pond. Like the leaves are huge, the growth is really fast and they just love it. So. I wanted to still get the benefits of um, the things that Pond offers, but I love that Lekka does not suck up the water as fast as Pond does. So I've been mixing it and it's worked really well. I do have some other plants that I can show you that I've done it with as well. Um, but yeah, just from what you can see here, it seems to have really loved it. So I'm going to keep it in this like pond and Lekka mixture for probably indefinitely. And um, and yeah, we'll see how it goes. If you're not familiar with Lechuza Pond, um, this stuff is great. It's basically just mineral stones that is a soil alternative. Um, it has like high capillary properties in that it acts like Lekka and draws water up from the bottom of the pot um, up to the top of the planter and it absorbs excess fertilizer and it like distributes nutrients to the roots of your plant. Um, there's zeolite in it which is really good for maintaining like a good pH balance. And yeah, there's like, there's a bunch of other really good stuff. This is one of my most recent imports. Um, this is a philodendron Dean McDowell. If you've never heard of it before, it's just a hybrid of a philodendron gloriosum and a philodendron pastazanum. And this is probably one of my all time favorite philodendron hybrids. Um, I have a big one on my shelf. This one was just imported and it's sort of still acclimatizing to my apartment, hence the yellowing leaves, but the Cataphil looks amazing. It's like tripled in size, so I think it's gonna be just fine. Um, this one was actually imported with, with roots, but most of those roots have died off. You can see, um, maybe you can't. So this root right here, that's sort of like that yellowish brown color, that was one of the roots that it came with. And then this one right here is totally brand new. And you can see more of those sort of like reddish pinkish roots that are forming like right here. And I did um, propagate this one purely in water first. I had it in water for maybe, um, I wanna say a week and a half. And then once I started noticing that this cataphyll was getting pretty red and big, I thought it could use a nutrient boost and that's when I decided to move it to um, the pond and like a mixture. And since then, it's just done so well. I know it looks pretty sad, but the yellowing actually hasn't continued and it's it's looked like this for a while now. So it's now living in my living room next to a humidifier and I'm currently acclimating it down from 70% humidity to 
50%. And it's a, yeah, it's a champ. As you can see, it's um, doing really, really well. So water propagation was a success. So water propagation was a success. How come I can't say that? Water propagation was a success. And I would say the transfer was a success as, oh my gosh, I can't say success. I'm, what's happening? Okay, 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 start over, reset, okay. I can't talk today, I can't talk today. Pudge, what did I say about being the bigger person? You're safe in this apartment, nobody can get you. I will always protect you, what else? And floss your teeth. Right, exactly, I know. See, so just relax. So as I was saying, um, water propagation was successful. The transfer to passive hydro was successful. And um, this is actually what I'm going to be growing it in long-term. I don't ever plan to move this to soil. I will keep it in this leka and pond mixture for as long as it will allow me to, which I hope is forever. <laughs> to be honest, there's not a whole lot to say about leka and pond propagation besides the fact that it's amazing. Um, I guess the only thing I hope you take away from it is that I've had the most success always rooting in water first and then moving it to leka. Um, but I have rooted bigger plants straight away in leka, um, usually plant with like thicker stems, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you guys is how I propagate in perlite. And I feel like not a ton of people talk about perlite propagation, but it is amazing. I prefer using a coarse perlite or a grade 4 perlite, which is much bigger than regular perlite. But this is more expensive, it's less available. So for the sake of this video, I'm going to show you how I prepare just regular perlite because that's actually what I use um, more often. I'm gonna sound a little bit muffled in a bit because I'm gonna wear a mask and please wear a mask when you're preparing perlite. Um, you don't want to be inhaling that dust and it's very dusty. That is all dust and you don't want this in your plants. Um, so I'm gonna show you how I get this cleaned up. I would also recommend you do any kind of perlite preparation outside. Normally I would just open up my my balcony doors and then prepare outside, but I don't wanna haul all my equipment out there. So I have Pudge far away from me. I've got the windows open and I'm just gonna prepare a really small amount just to show you how I do it. What you're gonna need for this is two strainers, two bowls, and then obviously a perlite and some kind of scooper. And what you're gonna do is just set one of the strainers on top of the bowl. And you're just going to very lightly and carefully push around that perlite to just sift it and get some of that dust out. And you can also use a spray bottle to settle some of that dust, but because I'm trying to get the dust out and not just settle it, I'm not gonna be spraying it. But once this is all sifted, um, a little bit of dust kick up is still gonna be normal. So like, let's say if you're using this for your soil mix, then I would definitely spray it to avoid that dust being kicked up when you're pouring it in or mixing it around. So you can see how much dust I got just from this small amount. And then what I'm gonna do is get that second strainer and I'm just gonna do a second sift. And I'm pretty happy with this. So I'm just going to pour it into my empty bowl. So dusty. And then I'm just gonna repeat that process. Okay. 
this is what you're left with and it's just a lot cleaner. And the next thing that you're gonna do is just give it a good rinse. I feel like some of you are probably wondering why I didn't just rinse it off the bat, um, like straight from the bag. And to be honest, I used to do that. I would just poke holes down at the bottom of the perlite bag and just run it in the shower and call it a day. But I started reading about like allowing an excess of perlite dust to run in the waterways and there's like differing opinions. Some people say like it's not good. Some people say um, it's fine. But if I can, if there's even a question, then you know, I'm just gonna avoid it. So this is what I do now. And when you pre-sift, like there's not a lot that's going down this drain. And I just, I just feel better at the end of the day. So if you live in an apartment where you don't have a backyard that you can just like hose your bag down, um, this is a good alternative. Same with preparing Leka. You really don't want a lot of that dust, like that clay dust from the Leka going down the drain. Um, I heard that it can like clog drains and just, yeah, like you just don't want to be doing that. So sifting it beforehand and just eliminating that dust before you're running it in your sink is going to be super helpful. Now that the perlite is washed and with as little dust as possible, um, I'm going to take that fertilizer water that I prepared earlier and just add a little bit straight to the perlite. The reason that I love perlite propagation so much is because of like how porous and airy and light it is. You can see just by getting a, a spoonful here, naturally it's not collapsing onto itself. And my neighborhood is just, my neighborhood does not want me to film today. There's like trains blaring on their horns, there's children yelling and someone like banging on something outside. Um, okay, so yeah, you can see just with a spoonful, the perlite doesn't, yeah, it's not super compressed. It just kind of holds its shape. And so when you have something in there, it has a lot of like room to grow. It has a lot of um, air pockets to breathe. It doesn't get sort of suffocated and, um, and yeah, it's great. I have some Skindapsis Pictus Silver Splash cuttings here. I have like a four inch um, pot here that has no drainage holes. I'm like trying to look in the monitor and do this at the same time, so not that coordinated. Okay, and then I'm going to take my cuttings and stick it in here. And then I just use my finger to poke around and try and fill in some air pockets. I'm just gonna add a tiny bit more. Can you guys hear Pudge snoring in the background? <laughs> it's like a symphony. Okay, so this is looking pretty good. All of my nodes are covered, the stem is covered, and now I'm just going to fill it with water. I'm just using regular tap water to add to this pot, and you're gonna treat it like the way you do with Leka, and I'm gonna just fill till about right here, um, like 25% of the way. Next on our agenda is talking about moss propagation. And this is probably my favorite way to root anything. Um, as I've mentioned, like a broken record, I always start in water first if it's rootless. And then once it starts poking out roots, um, just like teeny tiny roots, I move it to moss right away. I've got this one in moss. This one started as a teeny tiny baby. This was the first leaf. And um, I think when I received it, it was, I think it was in Lekka. And then I moved it right away to moss because I knew that I didn't want to grow it long-term in Lekka. So I'm just going to take this out. 
And then I'm gonna grab my small potty mat. Oops. I'm gonna take this out because this root system is wild. And I've done sort of a mix of the choose upon and moss. And this has kind of been magical for me because the pond gives it some nutrients. It's got the slow release fertilizer, but then I also get the benefit of using moss and mixing substrates has just kind of been my jam lately. So this is the tiny bulb that it was grown from. I did not grow it from bulb. I, um, I got this from my friend and she, <laughs> and she grew it. I have never been more excited to finish a video. I feel like this week, my neighborhood doesn't want me to film. It's been the noisiest week. It's had the most distractions. It's been so hot. I just, I'm ready to be done. Anyway, um, so these are the roots and these are all moss roots. And I think what I'm gonna be doing is moving it to aeroid soil because I find that alocasias do really well in soil or um, leca. And I kind of do want to see this guy get really big, even though, oddly, I'm not a huge fan of huge um, cuprias. I'm not a huge fan of huge cuprias. Um, but I don't know. I just, I, I do want to see it sort of transform. And then once it gets to the point that it freaks me out, I will give it to my friend Alice and call it a day. So yeah, these are nice little moss roots. I'm not gonna show you how I transplant this into soil um, just because I need to prep some soil right now. Everything that you need to see about sphagnum moss to soil transition is in my sphagnum moss video. What I am gonna do though is do a little bit of surgery on this philodendron plowmanii import that's currently in water, but I wanna get it into moss right away. And um, I'm gonna show you why I'm choosing to do that right now. Okay, first off, I thought this little contraption that Erin did was super cool. Apparently she learned it from somebody else, but it's just two pieces of like that plant Velcro stuff. And it's just, it's wrapped around the perimeter of this and just kind of like hanging onto this bamboo stake like that. It's genius. It's the little things, you know. I'm gonna tell you right now, I never in my life would have um, thought of doing that because if you take a look at my shelf right now, I'm using tape, I'm using rocks. Um, I don't have an engineering mind, okay? If you've never seen a fresh import before, feast your eyes on this. <laughs> a lot of these roots are, um, are dead and I'll get this cleaned up but you can see sort of these acclimated roots that have started to poke out and how different they look from the import roots. And the reason that I'm going to move this to moss now is because like I mentioned, <laughs> I swear this whole video is me being a broken record, but like I mentioned, these water roots are a lot more delicate than um, soil roots. So the plan is going to be to move it to aeroid soil eventually. So I want to develop more um, hardy roots and I wanted to get it I want to get it into moss right away so this is about an inch and a half long and this is usually how long I like my roots before I move it into moss um, so that's what I'm gonna do I never get any less nervous doing this um, what I'm gonna do is cut right right between here where there's sort of a curve in the in the chunk hopefully i can get this on camera and not fall out of the frame cut right here and this is what we're left with Everything looks great. There's no rot inside. It looks perfectly healthy. What I'm going to do now is actually dip this in rooting hormone, which is somewhere on this very messy table. If you guys could see the destruction around me. <laughs> um, where? 
Oh. oh, I'm holding it. Oh my gosh, you guys. Okay, so I have my rooting hormone here. I'm just going to do a little dip. And cover it about that much. And then the next very important part while you're letting it sort of callous and um, harden off is you want to protect these very very delicate roots that need to be in water or need to have hydration. What I'm going to do is take this paper towel that's already wet and I'm going to wrap it around those roots very gently because they can snap off and I'm just going to go around like this leaving the tip exposed and then I'm going to take my new Mossify Mister, which I love very much. Um, if you want some information on this, go to my Instagram and I have a highlight on it. Um, it's an automatic spray bottle and it's amazing. So I'm just going to wet this a little bit more. And then basically just going to let it chill out for like an hour and then I'm going to move it into moss. Here is the other chunk and I think I'm gonna just leave it like this instead of trying to chop it into three or two or whatever. Um, but I'm gonna just be, I'm just gonna, you know, YOLO it and, uh, do people still say YOLO? Oh my God, I'm not cool. Um, I'm just gonna chop off all these roots. Where's my scissor? Where is anything? Oh my gosh, this place is a wreck. The reason that I'm gonna chop these roots off is because the chances of it turning to mush is very high at this point. They're already a little bit soggy and gross and when you, and see, look, it's already coming off. When you have things like, um, like inactive or like mushy roots that can actually cause a lot of like bacteria and gross things to grow underneath your substrate which can then rot your actual stem so if you can avoid it you should and step one of that is just eliminating some of these like these roots that are doing nothing for your plant i could clean chunks all day like if i could choose a job within the plant industry, it would be like chunk cleaning services. So we're gonna take a slight detour and just clean up this chunk a little bit. This is the infamous earwax scraping, earwax scraping tool um, that I've shown on my Instagram as well. There was a lot of debate about what this actually was. It was a toss up between a cuticle pusher and an earwax scraper, but after doing research, it appears it is an earwax scraper. So it's for hard wax. Uh, anyway, that's not the point. What I like to do with my chonks is just clean it up because again, the less sort of like mush and just like nasty stuff you have, hanging on to your, your chunks and your stems and things like that, the better chance you're giving your um, propagations at rooting without any issues in terms of like bacteria and stuff like that that often take many of our propagations. So what I'm doing is just taking this scraper and just gently brushing away at some of this sort of like black uh, build up on the chunk and I want to be sure to not scrape off these little um, come on these little beginnings of new roots here and this is an auxiliary growth point that's where new growth is going to come out of and there hello Pudge there's another one here and another one here so yeah, I'm just gonna keep cleaning. And I'll, I'll put some music on for ya.
And this is what we're left with. It looks kind of pitiful now, like peeled ginger, but it'll callus back up. It'll probably turn green again um, once I get it into the prop box. But yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about it. I think that I don't know if anything is going to happen here because there's quite a bit of sort of like calloused over rot that has taken over a little bit of that growth point, but I'm feeling really good about these two. Um, oh, there's three. One, two, three, four. All right, well, we'll see what happens to this guy. Actually, before I undo these, I'm going to cut off the ones that I'm not feeling great about. And I'm not feeling great about this one. Gotta go. Um, not feeling great about this one. Gotta go. And, uh, hmm. You know what I'm gonna do? Okay, I'm gonna cut off this one because this one is like, this one's nasty. But this one, I'm not too mad at. Um, I'm going to remove some of these like secondary roots growing out of this primary one here. Like these are all gross and dead, but this one looks actually quite healthy and it's, it's pretty red down at the bottom. So I'm just going to manually pick these off. I'm going to uncover this and I'm going to do the same thing and just clean up some of that mush that's on the stem without trying to disturb or without disturbing those brand new roots. To be honest, um, I should have cut a little bit lower just in case this rots. I didn't really give myself a whole lot of um, space to work with in case there is rot, but we're gonna say a little prayer. I'm going to be putting it in the same um, container that it was in. And what I'm gonna do is just grab my moss and I'm gonna add a little bit at the bottom. And this moss is mix mixed with a little bit of a uh, cocoa husk. I'm gonna stick this guy in there. And pack it in. on the outside and then I'm gonna wrap it really really tight and then I'm gonna take the top one I think and go like this to secure it so now it's on there 
and then we take the petiole. Ah, I gotcha, I gotcha. Okay, wow. Guys, that one almost broke my brain. Not gonna lie. Okay, we're gonna go. <laughs> How am I still laughing? Honestly, I'm kind of in a foul mood, but we're gonna just, <laughs> we're gonna trek through this together. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. So, we're gonna go up here and just take our one little Velcro tie and secure the bag. I got this secured to a pole or a bamboo stick and then it's also secured to the pot. And now I'm just going to wet the moss. Um, this is kind of like the, this is about how damp I want my moss, but when I'm moving from water into moss, I like to keep the moss a little bit more on the damper side, um, just so that it's not shocked by the lack of water that it's receiving right away. So I'm just going to water it. And I'm going to keep this in my largest EXO, which is at a constant 80 to 90% humidity. I'm gonna give it tons of light, a lot of warmth, and um, yeah, we'll just keep checking in. And I am hoping that within the next few days, I can see some little ro roots, <laughs> roots poking out of here. My pride and joy, I'm just kidding. My pride and joy, <laughs> um, my other pride and joy. This is a Monstera Deliciosa Brazilian common form. Um, these are incredible. They are just, they're delicious. The leaves. Here we have a Monstera Deliciosa Brazilian common form. And if you've never seen one of these before, now you have. It's not super different than um, just the regular Deliciosas that you see at like your local nursery, but the leaves are much stiffer than a regular Deliciosa. Like they don't bend as easily. The pinations run really, really deep to the midrib and like the fenestrations are super close to the midrib as well. The leaf shape is just like they're rounder and uh, yeah, they're just really cute. <laughs> the reason that I'm showing this to you today is because I wanted to talk about mixing different substrates for harder to root plants. And the reason that I chose this combination specifically for this plant was because the stem kept rotting. Um, I have about, I want to say about three to four inches of stem left on this cutting and it used to be really long. It used to be like probably a foot long, but it just kept rotting. So I was getting really close to the last viable node and the last aerial root that was already pushing out roots. I was scared that the stem was going to rot all the way up to that aerial root. So this was my latch latch <laughs> this was my last ditch effort to try and save this plant and uh and it worked the reason that i chose leca and moss is because leca wicks water upward naturally so i felt like okay well i could keep water levels pretty low here just enough to keep the leca somewhat wet but have it draw most of the water upward into the moss where that aerial root is because I didn't want that to dry out. It was doing just fine. But I didn't want the stem to be just like submerged in water. I didn't want it to be suffocated with moss. So what I did was I used about, I think this is like maybe two inches of, of leca, and I just set the stem right on top of the leca. There's no moss underneath the stem. It's actually sitting just right on top of it. So I sat it on top of there and then I just packed around with moss because like I said, I think it's probably around right here 
where that um, aerial root was poking out and I wanted to be sure that that was getting enough hydration and yeah, it worked like a charm because these roots have just exploded and I'm guessing, <laughs> totally guessing that the stem stopped rotting because it's been stable and um, the yellowing that was once taking over this plant where all of this brown is, because it used to be pristine. There was like no cosmetic damage to this leaf basically at all. And then when the stem started to rot, all of this turned like a bright yellow and I just, I knew something was wrong. So now all of that has dried up and I had never been so happy to see like dried edges, but um, that was kind of a sign that I knew it was stabilizing. So as much as I would love to show you, um, oh, actually the stem is right here. And you can see it's nice and green and there's no more rot that's kind of taking over and it's doing great. How funny, I totally didn't even realize that I had placed it that way so that I could see it. Sometimes I just impress myself. Um, so yeah, it's doing really good in here. Right now, I am not fertilizing it with like anything strong, like liquid gold leaf. I'm just using um, that diluted mix that I made earlier, which is just CalMag and um, Marfil. And I'm right now, since there's no growth on this thing, I'm just fertilizing once a month. In the fall and winter, I was doing it every other month. So it's been very, very light. I've just been working on, obviously, getting the root system started. I'm not really concerned about leaf growth at this point. So yeah, I'm feeling really good about this one. The reason behind using three different substrates for this one was pretty similar to what happened with my other common form. The stem just kept rotting. This one didn't have any aerial roots. It was just purely stem. I was a little bit worried because it looked, it looked, it looked sketchy. The stem was like super wrinkled, but it was like still kind of firm, but like really wrinkly. And I was pretty sure that it was starting to rot from the inside. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's fine now because it's rotted, rotted. <laughs> Charmaine rooted. And um, I think the reason that I added perlite was because the stem on this one was rotting a lot faster than the other one and I know that perlite has high uh, water retention but it's also very very porous. I liked that I could create even more air pockets inside of this perlite so yeah I just did it. I layered some leca, I layered a little bit of perlite and I have the stem sitting on top of the perlite and um, yeah, I have about this this much stem that I'm working with and It's like we've got a lot of brand new roots poking out. This lighting is so annoying I kind of want to take it out of here But because this was so hard to root unfortunately, I'm not willing to risk messing with it just for a video <laughs> but I think that when I do actually unpot this one I will record it because um, yeah, I think I should do a, like a follow-up video for a lot of the things that I'm discussing in some of these videos uh, But yeah That's uh, sort of how I mix how I mix different substrates. So besides mixing sphagnum moss and like pond or um, Sphag and like cocoa husk, which you can see in my other video Leca and moss has been just like a magical duo for me and I highly recommend doing it for your monstera. I think somebody asked me a question about how to root a monstera. Give this a go and see if it works. You want to keep the water line, like I said, with um, not perlite, but actually I don't even think I discussed that with Leca. So with growing in drainage hole pots using Leca, you normally want to cover about 25% of it because it's going to draw it up. You don't want too much just kind of sitting there at the bottom because as you can see, there are roots that are sort of swirling around this pot and yeah, you just don't want it. You don't want too much water sitting down at the bottom. So 25%, that's all you need. The LECA will do the rest of the work for you and, um, and yeah, that's all I have to say about that. What about you, Pudge? 
Okay, yeah, I agree. So I have a philodendron Brazil here and I just wanted to talk a little bit about spent nodes. This one might be controversial because I feel like some people don't believe spent nodes are a thing and then other people do and I'm one of the people that believe that spent nodes are a thing. And I previously chopped the tip of this. You can see where I chopped it off here and it grew new growth here out of the auxiliary bud from this leaf. And every single node has one dormant or inactive auxiliary bud. So this is that one. The one above it is right here. It's actually underneath this sheath. If I pull it back, it'll be under there. You can kind of see it's like a lump. And then the one before that, it's right here. So every single node, meaning like every single leaf has one auxiliary bud and it's activated when you cut the plant or when it feels like it's, um, I guess, under attack. And it's the way that the plant naturally continues its growth to survive wherever it is. So now I'm gonna cut right here. And this is what I'm left with. So this is the original leaf from that plant. This is the stem that I just cut. And this is the brand new growth that came from that auxiliary bud. I'm gonna cut right here. And now I'm left with this. This would be considered a spent node because we already used the one auxiliary bud that this node had and now this stem has nowhere else to push out new growth. So once this leaf dies, even if I can get this to root, this it's not gonna do anything else. There are people that say that that's not a thing, that the stem will just magically push out growth from somewhere. Where it comes out of, I have no clue. I've never actually seen proof of this before, ever in any of these like, heated conversations that I've read um, on forums and Facebook. So if someone wants to blow my mind right now, please reach out to me. I'd love to see any proof you have that spent nodes aren't a thing um, because this is how I understand that plant, that plants work. Um, so yeah, this is a spent node. It's not gonna do anything anymore. And I just <laughs> killed it for no reason. For the sake of this video, no less. But it's okay because I've got this little guy and I'm going to reroot it in water and then I'll just add it to this pot. Before I take you into the plant room to show you my propagation exoterra, I wanted to show you how I put together my prop boxes because even though I do utilize a pretty good sized exo for propagations, I still love using like this whole um, plastic bin takeout container method. Um, so this is one of my prop boxes and in here I am obviously farming a bunch of Scandapsis Pictus Silver Splash. This is mostly for my family back in California where this isn't as common to find. So I've just been propagating a ton for them to bring back. And um, I also have just a Anthurium pendens in here trying to not kill it but we'll see how that goes so i'll show you where i keep this in my plant room but it's pretty simple i basically just have a bunch of moss in here and i just kind of lay it down at the bottom and a lot of these started just as like wet sticks obviously this one wasn't but all of these smaller leaves that you see are all stem propagations so when I'm taking propagations, I basically cut the ends, I let it callous completely, and then I stick it in the XO. You don't want to stick fresh cuttings in the XO because the chances of it like not sealing up and then rotting is really high. And I'm pretty sure I have one in here that I didn't allow to callous over. And it might be this one <laughs> that's all yellow. But yeah, sometimes I get lazy and I just like kind of chuck it in there and uh, and yeah, it rots off. So even something like this, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave this out for a little bit to callus over before I stick it back in there. I feel like 
most people who don't have success with prop boxes is because they're not giving it the right conditions. Airflow is still very important for, um, for prop boxes, even though you want that high humidity. So what I'm using, I'm trying to find the lid. These are actually just like little reptile boxes that are from a local like aquarium reptile store and that's Pudge throwing a tantrum. These ones were literally made for reptiles so they have little tiny holes here for airflow and these have been so perfect because it just allows the perfect amount of air to go in and out of it without letting it dry up completely. So these have been great for propagations. Otherwise, I just have been using these boxes and every few days I'll just open it up and just sort of rest it on top and just let it get some air. I typically won't let it go like weeks and weeks without getting some airflow. I'm gonna just quickly show you how I assemble um, my prop boxes and You'll find that sometimes a lot of like yucky things will grow inside of these prop boxes because of the high humidity and the lack of airflow usually. So what I do is mix either horticultural charcoal in with it or even just activated charcoal. And today I'm gonna be using activated charcoal since I'm running a little bit low on my horticultural charcoal. So I'm just using these activated charcoal pills that I got from a drugstore. And for this amount of moss, I'm gonna use about two pills. Actually, I think just one is gonna be fine for this amount. I don't wanna overdo it. And you just mix. And it's gonna look kind of scary, but it's totally fine. <laughs> and eventually, once you have your prop box sort of in like the right conditions, it'll like turn green anyway and this black sort of uh, goes away. And actually I probably could have just used half a caplet, caplet, tablet, tablet? Capsule, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's been a long day, what time is it? Oh, it's almost six o'clock. I've been filming since like eight o'clock this morning. This is a lot of work. Um, and I'm still not feeling very confident in how well this video is gonna be put together. But anyway, so this is my yucky looking, um, my moss now. So give it a few days in the right conditions and all of the green will sort of overtake the black. Do this, and then I'm gonna take my spray bottle. And then I've got the chunk from before, and I'm just going to place it inside of the container and sort of like tuck it in. You don't wanna cover it all the way um, cause you want it to be able to breathe still, but I try and cover at least the sides so that some of those, those nodes are like, are packed with moss and, uh, it like stimulates root production. And then I just close it and that's it. We are... You want to tell them where we are? Right, we're in the plant room. Okay, we got the panting to stop, but now we're on to the snorts. So I'm just going to power through this and we're all just gonna to have to deal with the background noise. Um, as I was saying, this is my propagation exoterra in the plant room and it's right underneath my big exo. The size of this is a 24, 18, 12. I did have to shave down, well I didn't do it. My friend Nick helped me shave down the plastic so that it could fit in here because it was like slightly too tall. But yeah, it works fine now. I don't use any heat mats in here because as I mentioned earlier, I don't trust myself with them. I've just heard they catch fire and I'm just not about that. So the only warmth it's getting is from this grow panel, which is actually very efficient because it gets really warm. 
Um, so humidity in here can pretty much be at 100 as long as I'm maintaining the moisture of this moss. And I basically just go in with my automatic sprayer maybe like every two days and I just rehydrate this moss. You can see that sort of little patch right here where there's still some activated charcoal, but the entire EXO used to have um, like that charcoal moss color and I mean, it's really hard to see now. Um, I can see little patches in person. I don't think it's picking up on camera, but yeah, it eventually sort of goes away as you mist and then um, as the moss starts to wake up and turn green, this sort of like black, unappealing color is hidden. So anyway, I'm gonna try and get this on camera. I'm gonna try and get this on camera, but I replaced the mesh top with an acrylic top with extra air holes um, drilled into it. And yeah, this has just been really great for keeping up humidity because with that mesh top, it's it wasn't really holding anything. So I used to um, cover it with plastic and it just looked really like, it just didn't look great. So that's how I keep up humidity. The lights in here are all on timers. Everything turns on in this plant room at 8.30 in the morning and it turns off at 8.30 at night. And, and yeah, that's about it. And then on the left here, I just keep some of my prop boxes that I showed you earlier. And um, it's not under any light at all. It's just getting light from what's casting on this side. And everything grows just fine. Um, all of these were stem grown just right here in this spot and yeah, I haven't, I haven't had any issues either. So, so yeah, that's it. Let me scoot back. Anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> I cannot believe how long this video is. But I told you in the beginning it was a heavy topic and even after like reviewing all the footage and editing this video, I feel like there's still so much that was left out. So I think maybe there'll be like a part two someday, but truth be told, I'm kind of like over the propagation topic for a while. But I hope that this video at least helped some people if you've been having trouble propagating or maybe there was like a little step that you weren't quite getting right that was causing your propagations to fail. Either way, I hope that these techniques helped and I did want to answer some questions that I wasn't able to answer throughout this video. So while I'm doing that, I'm just going to show you how I routinely clean out my EXO and maintain my propagations. If you're totally new to propagating, the best advice that I can give you is to do all of your experimenting on pothos, any type of pothos plant. They're a great way to understand how roots are formed. It's a great way to understand the best place to take cuttings. Um, it's a very rewarding plant to propagate because of how fast it grows. I learned how to propagate via water propagation first and I mentioned there's a lot of people that really advise against water propagating, but I'm totally pro water propagation. I still do it to this day. I do it for common plants and my imported plants, and I have a lot of success. I can't say success. I have a lot of success with it. Honestly, what is it with that word? Okay, like I was saying, um, beginner tips. Start with an easy plant. Just get something from your local nursery that's cheap and easily accessible and that won't make your bank account cry if you kill a bunch of propagations. Um, the next one is, honestly, you should know your conditions. That's just like, that's one piece of advice that I give to most people that are new to the hobby is like, know the type of light that is coming in through your windows know the humidity levels in your house, um, know the temperatures in your house because anything from like a blast of air from your heater to um, a draft from a window or a door can be like the one factor that has been going wrong this whole time with a plant that you're struggling with. So understanding your conditions in your home is huge because this is the ecosystem for your plants and it's not to say that like 
every single plant is going to thrive in you know your ecosystem but you can at least tailor the plants that you're bringing home to the conditions you're willing to give it so if you're not trying to do the whole indoor greenhouse thing or exoterra or cabinet and you kind of just want to shove plants wherever know your conditions and then you can go and google your heart away of the conditions that you know um, are good for each plant so yeah i think i totally rambled but I, I think that's the best advice that i have i'll eventually do a totally separate video about leka especially after seeing how many questions about it came up but i did want to answer these two questions because i felt like they were really relevant to propagating and to answer the first one, when I'm taking cuttings and I just do straight like a propagation, like I showed you with my Brazilian common form, typically I would keep the water level at about 25%. But for new cuttings or for plants that are a little bit more water loving or that are severely dehydrated, like maybe a new import for example, I actually keep the water line at around 50%. So. I wouldn't be scared to even cover the roots in water for maybe like the first few days. Um, but yeah, you really shouldn't have a problem with your roots drying up as long as you're keeping that water level um, at the right amount because LECA is a wicker, it draws water up, so all of that LECA should essentially be hydrated unless you're not putting enough. Another thing I want to mention about LECA is that Usually in like a big bag, they come in different sizes, like the actual size of the clay balls. And I've noticed that with like straight cuttings, if the clay balls are too big, it doesn't actually provide the plant with enough moisture. Um, because having like different size balls fill up all of the little pockets in there, um, it really does kind of like hold that stem with a bunch of hydration and water but if there's too much like pockets or there's too big of pockets between all the clay balls you do have a chance of like making your stem completely dry out or having the roots dry out so having a good mix of um, the clay ball size is good or if you're struggling with roots drying up or your stem drying up um, try using the smaller uh, clay balls because I find that the big ones are really great if you already have like an established root system Otherwise, um, yeah, sometimes it's not the greatest choice and if for whatever reason those two remedies don't work I would try using that mixed substrate like I showed you with my Monstera um, Using luck at the bottom and moss over top that might help you retain more moisture if that's what you're struggling with so for rot, I always use a sterile pair of scissors or shears when I'm taking cuttings and that's usually just like running it under boiling water and then using like rubbing alcohol to clean it off um, just to make sure that you're not transferring anything onto that stem from the scissors. And then also as far as the medium, I have the best success rehabbing rotted plants in perlite and leca. I feel like leca and perlite are just both very forgiving substrates in terms of mitigating rot. Perlite especially because it's so porous, it doesn't compress on itself, it doesn't sort of collapse and become really dense. So you're allowing a lot of airflow to move through, you know, the substrate and through the roots and it's just not being suffocated. And the same thing with leca too. There's a lot of air pockets between the clay balls as long as you're not packing it too tightly um there's only a maximum sort of amount of moisture that each clay ball can actually hold so as long as you're keeping your water levels controlled you really shouldn't have a problem with like overwatering. and i'm throwing up air quotes right now but um yeah so in terms of like switching up substrates, if those aren't working for me, absolutely. I am i don't think that like perlite and leca or moss or whatever is like a one size fits all. It's gonna fix all your problems. The cool thing about, you know, being in this hobby and sort of getting to know different substrates and the properties of different plants and how they grow is 
kind of like it's kind of like tinder like plant tinder it's like finding the substrate that works for a certain kind of plant and um using like the knowledge that you've learned over time to sort of like problem solve and diagnose and just like figure out how you can rehab this plant and sometimes it's different like you know i've rehabbed an elbow in straight moss and then i've had an elbow that hated moss and it did just fine in leka so again it's like every i feel like every cutting or every specimen is like its own little project and yeah there's not like a one size fits all you just kind of have to go with your gut and and be willing to experiment and i'm glad somebody asked about sealing in stems or like using wax to deal with rot and i know that people have success with it i've seen it done really well but i haven't had success with it in the past i feel like if anything you're kind of just like trapping in uh, bacteria and things that can eventually lead to more rot so i would rather have that stem exposed i would rather have it exposed to airflow and i want to be able to see what's happening with the stem so i'm not a fan of the waxing method i just like a nice clean cut um, i allow it to callus for several hours if i'm dealing with like a really really bad case of rot and you know just letting it really close up so that i know no nothing is going back into that stem I actually did a whole video on sphagnum moss and within that video I talked a bit about transitioning from moss into soil and I know you also asked about perlite but I find that there's not a huge difference between moss and perlite to soil um, transfer so give that video a watch if you haven't already. My preferred propagation method is actually the same for philodendrons and anthuriums. If I'm working with something that's completely rootless, it always starts in water, and then as soon as roots start poo poo <laughs> I almost said pooking. <laughs> as soon as roots start po- I'm not even gonna edit that out. As soon as roots start poking out, I will then move it to moss. But if I'm gonna be moving it to something like Leka or Lechuzapon, which I do have many of my philodendrons in, I'll just keep it in water for a little bit longer and then if you go to the very very beginning of this video i wait till the roots are about like seven inches long um until i until i move it but if the plan is going to moss then i'll move it as soon as i start seeing like a couple inches of roots poking out but if the plant does have roots on it already then moss is like my go-to substrate i won't even bother with water if it already has roots and i feel confident that those roots can healthfully and successfully cling on to that substrate um yeah that's my go-to method because i don't use any netted or cash pots with my plants that are in passive hydro or even just with my leca or pond propagations things can kind of get a little bit gross sometimes in terms of algae buildup especially since i'm using marfil which is a marine phytoplankton based um, soil enhancer and then also i'm using water from my shrimp tank so algae is like sort of a thing that I'm constantly dealing with in this house, but once you get used to the way it looks, I you just don't mind it. And honestly, it looks worse than it is for your plants. You just don't want it to build up too, too much. So what I do at least once a month is I do a hydrogen peroxide flush for all my plants. And I know that it seems kind of scary to just kind of like douse it in hydrogen peroxide, but I haven't had any like bad side effects with it yet. I just do it enough so that the bubbles kind of loosen up the algae on the sides of the pots and then also on the pond and the leka itself. So doing a hydrogen peroxide flush isn't going to completely clear your algae, but it definitely helps, especially if you're like on top of maintaining it before it gets bad. And another thing is, and then also if you're using pawn or leka, if you can keep it in something that is not a clear container, that's going to help minimize the amount of algae that's building up in a shorter period of time. So in a nutshell, being preventative and being proactive rather than waiting until things are bad, that's going to help with the algae in terms of maybe doing like a hydrogen peroxide flush or just giving it a rinse and then also covering your actual pot from especially direct light. 
I hope that I'm understanding and answering this question correctly, but if you're talking about the way that Lekka sort of has a tendency to get really stuck on roots, yes, that can be very annoying, but just submerging it in a bowl of water or a bucket of water just as is without disturbing it yet is going to help a lot. The added water um, is going to help loosen things up and will allow you to kind of peel the leka off without ripping a lot of those nice fuzzy roots. And once you can kind of massage it a little bit and move it around, just sort of like picking it off gently is not going to damage your entire plant. I would say that it's a little bit more difficult when you're dealing with like very, very hairline roots like the ones that I showed you from my orchid cactus in the beginning of the video. Sometimes those roots are just kind of impossible and they're gonna break off. But as long as you've got a nice like extensive root system, a little bit of root breakage isn't going to be like a make or break in terms of transplant. On that note though, and this is totally just a personal preference and this is just my opinion, but I don't recommend Leka propagation if the goal is going to be to move it to soil. Just because you'll notice um, with Leka roots, they're super like thick and nice and fuzzy and they're very similar to water roots. And a lot of the times those roots can suffocate under um, soil and it's just a little bit too dense. So if you're going to be propagating in Leka, I would say that the long term goal should be to either leave it in Leka or move it to pond. Um, but if you want to move things to soil, moss will always be my recommendation or perlite. Okay, this is the last question I'm going to answer because it's been like, it's almost been two hours. And if you're still here, honestly, what are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, thank you. But like, how have you sat through all of this? I'm losing my voice and I'm losing my mind. I have like a hot cup of tea next to me, but I still feel like I sound so hoarse. So I need to end this video and um, and yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer for this question unfortunately, but I would say that the only thing I can give you is observe the plant. If it's pushing out new growth, that means it's healthy and happy. It's very much alive. And then look at that root system. If it's extensive, if you feel confident that it can move from that substrate into another one and successfully hang on, then, then yeah, move it. And I know that there's like a huge thing about doing any kind of repotting in the colder months, but the same sort of concept about fertilizing holds true with repotting. And that's if, if the plant is growing and it needs to be repotted and it's showing, you know, steady growth, then I have never had a plant that just completely threw a fit because I decided to repot it in the middle of December. Obviously, you don't want to be messing with plants that are dormant, but sometimes, especially if you have like an indoor greenhouse or something and you're mimicking these sort of like spring and summer conditions year round, you're going to notice that your plants aren't going to stop growing. So for those plants, I would say if the root system is good and it's showing signs of growth, go ahead and move it. But if it's like, you know, it's not really growing, if the root system isn't that long yet or like that extensive yet, just leave it. I know that a lot of us can get a little bit impatient when moving plants and myself especially, I'm always anxious to move it into soil. But yeah, patience is a virtue and your plants will thank you for it. Hi, would you like to add anything? Any final thoughts? Would you like to tell everyone goodbye? And thanks for watching our video. And thank you for subscribing. Would you like to ask everyone to give it a thumbs up if you liked it? I think that would be really nice, huh? Okay, so before we go, let's tell everybody how much we love them and say thank you for being here on our one month anniversary on YouTube. And did you know that you're almost at a thousand subscribers? Okay, so before we go, let's give them a high five. Do you wanna give them a high five? Okay, high five. Yeah, bye.